Vegas has this team at eight and a half wins. And we always kind of lean back on Vegas. Like last year, they had them six and a half. We got seven. They tend to be pretty accurate. They make a lot of money. They're smart. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This year, they got them at eight and a half. Eight and a half wins. Yeah. So if the Bears come out of this with a nine-win season, do you look at that as a success? Depending on depending on the context of what nine games is, right? Um, Vegas is always my go-to in the sense of like the numbers never lie kind of thing. Um, eight and a half feels like such a tough number to guess because I feel like we're, I don't feel like we're going to be right at that number this season for some reason. I feel like we're going to be way below it or we're going to be way above it. And so uh, a nine win season and you're like third in the division and you didn't even push for a playoff spot. You were like the third or fourth wild card option or something like that. I feel like it'll feel bad, but I guess I guess my short answer is yes, it's a successful season. Nine wins is probably a successful season. The only caveat I have to that is last year there was so much bad luck. And such a sloppy start, and they went. They had seven wins. Yeah. Um, last year could have just as easily been games. nine wins. Yes, yes. There were a couple of games that really came down to one play. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were uh, there were a couple. Like, uh, look at the Lions collapse. We were up twenty eight points. Denver. Denver. Yeah. Cleveland. At the end. Cleveland literally came down to one play. Came down to hail mary. Yeah. I mean, uh, Tampa, or even, or even you could say the, the pass that Robert Tunyon dropped. That could have changed yeah. Cleveland, you know. Um, and it's not like, you know, and, and then we had the number one pick from Carolina. So it's not like hurting. It would have hurt us to win more games by any means. Like, no, we're getting Caleb anyway. Like, they were, they were out there trying, you know what I mean? And, yeah, it just, just came really, really, really short. But I remember um, when they had Greg Olson on ESPN 1000, Waddle and Sylvie did, um, they were talking to him, and they said, hey, what was that, like, what was that season before the Super Bowl year like? Because you guys only had six wins. And then the next year you came out and, and you were a Super Bowl you know, you appeared in the Super Bowl. And he goes, yeah, we had six wins. But he's like, but we felt like we should have had 12. He's like, six of those games were right on the wire, man. He's like, we knew we knew how good we were. And we knew that we're just this far away. And he's like, so when we came out next year, we just got that much better. And we were able to sit there and capitalize on it. And we knew we were a good team, even ending the year with six wins. And so there's a certain mentality because, like, kind of like you said, the eye test, the flow of it. And, and kind of how we get there. It does matter. It does matter. So it, I think nine wins could be a successful season. But I think if, if you look back and you have some stupid losses and you wind up at nine wins, you're going to feel a little bad. So, yeah, I think that's a great answer, David, because I think it does depend on how it happens. You know what else, too? And I, I think about this when, I, when you mention it that way. So the first year of Ryan Poles' rebuild, that's – you're not going to call it an intentional tank, but let's, it's pretty much what it was, right? When you ended up with the first round pick the first time, your own, that was, it wasn't an intentional tank, but it was an unintentional uh, purging of the roster, clearing of cap space. It was, you know, fixing what, what was left for you. And even after that, and we like, we talked about this local personality in Yurko, right? Saying like, it was a three win team, but really it's about a six win team here, right? And then that's why I think going into this season, I remember listening to Yurko at one point and him saying uh, this would be an eight to nine win team, right? And it was a seven win team, but the way it happened with seven games is <clears throat> fluky, right? So you could argue that you kind of saw similar patterns the first two years, right? With these like inconsistencies and maybe some bad play calling and everything. If you even get a whiff of that this year and it doesn't come down to these fluky miracle plays and it's the NFL, it happens to every team all the time, but it feels like the bears are particularly, excuse me, cursed in this area. If that starts to happen again this year, even if you get to nine wins or 10 wins, but these fluky things keep happening, um, I think that's a coaching problem. I don't think... I don't think you can hide that anymore with like lack of discipline or whatever. Something has to change. And if you're not going to get rid of the players, it has to be the coaching. 
And then you just try to like give Sean McVay part ownership or something like that. You know what I mean? And just bring him in with Shane Waldron or something. You got to do something because if they're, if they're fluky, weird mistakes happening and you can't fix it and you just keep kind of going the woe is me route, like, man, we're just so close. We're just so close. At that point, it's the third year Matt Eberflus, and we haven't been fans of him in particular up till now. And so at that point, I think you just got to say, you got to cut the cord and you got to move on. But like, yeah, like I said, like the, ha- the how, the how it wins. That would, that would be a crappy situation, man. That would it would be crazy. awful, but it might be, it might be better than keeping him around, right? I mean, I guess, yeah. I mean, but if the defense is performing, and yeah, but then you take a look at his overall record. I mean, if you, if you don't clean that thing up fast somehow, you know, coaches come up to contract time too. <laughs> like they got to argue their case too. Um, so, you know, I think, I think a, a, a really good year for this team would definitely help Matt, Matt Eberflus's case out long term. And I want that. I want the consistency here. I want him to be a, a good coach and I want all that to happen. But yeah, that's, that's why, like, early in the show, I forget who said it, a hot start is so important. You cannot do that to yourself. I mean, I know the statistics have changed a little bit since it's become a 17-game season, but when it was a 16-game season, man, if you went 0-2, I think your playoff chances dropped down to 10%. 0-3, you're pretty much dead in the water. Yeah. You know what I mean? I so think I think it had an 0-2 team won the Super Bowl once ever, and it was the New York Giants, I want to say, when they were like a wild card team or something. So, yeah, you're right. It's just you're you're, you're hoping for a statistical miracle. But that's the thing. It's like – the first two years, I don't know whether you call it bad luck or just like incompetence in terms of organizational, you know, how you run it. The first year you could say it was like a learning year. Luke gets, was inflexible. Um, right. And then you had that mini buy and then they start playing better because they start finally like paying attention. And then last year, I mean, last year was an absolute catastrophe. The Alan Williams thing. And I'm kind of trying to gauge my season rewatch and kind of, go with the flow of what's going on in the background of that team. And it's just with, for Flus, like giving Flus excuses is, is easier than it is hard because it's like it, you know, I think we've said this to each other in private, like there's excuses and there's reasons and excuses are kind of just like, well, this happened and this happened. So I couldn't do my job, but like, it is very hard to do your job when, you know, your defensive coordinator gets, fired slash resigned for whatever you know rumor reasons there are it is hard to get on track with that offensive coordinator who's still the same not good coordinator he's incompetent we can say but like luke gets he's in the nfl who knows how incompetent he is but then they're starting to roll they're having good success on offense and then what happens vikings game fields gets hurt you lose him for four games five games and then he comes back now you're rolling again and by then it's already too late you Carolina is giving you that first round pick that that chemistry is not gelling. There's a lot of reasons I would say that Eberflus is better than we think he is. And there's a lot of reasons to say maybe Eberflus is really, really bad. But I, I can't I think this year you have to right. Like we said last year, going into last year, at the end of the season, you need to know if you want to keep Justin Fields or if you have to move on from Justin Fields. And a middling season is the worst thing that can happen. And another middling season from Matt Eberflus, I think, might be the worst thing that can happen to this franchise. If you're not sure yeah. if you want to keep Matt Eberflus, that's a, that's a bad thing. That that that's a good point because, like you said, we did say the same thing about the quarterback. Like, you, you want certainties in this league, you know. But but then but then I look at a situation like the Eagles. Look at Sirianni. Sirianni was in a Super Bowl. He's on a hot seat later. Look at Doug Peterson. Doug Peterson won a Super Bowl. Three years later, he's fired. <laughs> like, it's mm-hmm. so interesting how that changes. I mean, for Christ's sake, Matt Nagy was coach of the year, wasn't he? Yeah. So. It, it is more of a long-term thing, too, and that's why, I mean, the overall, the record's not great either. Like, you got to start winning and keep winning. I want to say, I'd, I'd still be like, okay, it's a step forward, but, like, I think, and I know we want to reserve our, ex, you know, expectations, but I want to get excited a little bit. The game's, first game's in a couple days, this and that. Like, it's so easy to rattle off 10 wins on the schedule, too. It really is. Like, when you go through the mm-hmm. schedule, it's almost too easy, which is why it feels like a trap. Like, it, it can't be that easy. It's not going to be. But, man, do we have an up? 
a lot of opportunities here. I know a lot of guys out there are predicting, you know, double digit wins. And then last year when I saw, you know, somebody predict them going 11 and six, I laughed this year. Somebody predicts that. And I'm like, Oh, okay. It it's realistic. Happen. Like I'm yeah. not going to sit here and laugh anymore because it's within the realm of possibilities. So, you know, they got to stay healthy, right? Yeah. Like, that has to be part of, part of the big part of the equation here. Like you need to stay healthy in order to for this thing to gel right and be good but man i am so excited to watch it i don't know about you we're so close yeah so. 10 wins in a playoff run I, i'm happy with that season and i want to keep loose that's uh, i'm gonna agree with that by the way like 10 wins in a playoff push or you make the playoffs as a wild card oof, i'm i i would want to keep loose I, that makes me so excited that the next year with 10 draft picks that's that's a super bowl push to fall in this time next year you get 10 wins and a playoff the following year, 364 days from now, we're talking about what are we doing to contend? Who do we have to beat in the NFL playoffs? Yeah. Like, and that that's a position then that you put yourself into where you may wind up trying to sign a home run free agent or something. Now it's worth it to try and get that one more piece that'll put you over the top that'll make you a serious contender, right? Yeah, because that's that's you're assuming at that point that Caleb – is what you need him to be, right? Hopefully you're not doing it because Caleb got you there with uh, running the ball and he was Rex Grossman, right? And he had 22 touchdowns and 15 picks. That's... David, I don't know if you could repeat it. I love the story you told me about Tom Brady and Julian Edelman. Yeah. That Julian Edelman told. I don't know if you could share yeah. that. Well, we're big on we're big on that, you know, that the quarterback needs to eventually elevate the the inferior talent around him and make them better, right? And uh, I remember just watching that on a, on a, on a podcast that Julian Edelman had, I think it's his podcast. And he was just saying that um, he went to go work out with Tom Brady and Julian Edelman was, I believe a fifth round pick, if I'm not mistaken, right? Fifth round pick, seventh round pick, seventh, um, seventh, seventh round pick. And so Julian Edelman was just like, you know, I want to make this team. I want to, I want to work hard. And so he went to a throwing session with Tom Brady and on uh, you know, when you're running full speed, NFL routes, 20, 30 yards, and you're going hard. 20, 30, 40 reps at a practice are are more than enough, right? 30, 30 reps is the amount of passes you're gonna, you know, see attempted during an NFL game. Maybe 50 nowadays, right? Like that's the attempt number. But uh Julian Edelman was saying, like, you know, during a practice like that, you're running 20, 30 routes. And I think he said that him and Tom Brady made Tom Brady made him run like 75 to like 85 routes that day. And he was just puking his guts out and he was just miserable and all that. But the whole time he's like chewing him out like, hey, when you're running a comeback, I don't want to see you chop stepping, turning over this side and then coming back towards the sideline. He's like, I want you to just flip that hip and then box out the guy and catch it because that's the way I like to throw that damn ball. He's like, if you do it that way, the way you're taught, my throws aren't going to work with you. So I know you're used to it this way or whatever, but. He was basically just saying that that whole chemistry thing that we always talk about and that everybody always kind of harps on, but it's more about just like Caleb Williams at the end of the day will be here. If he's good, he's the constant. So that's when you start seeing teams, you know, just draft players for that guy rather than being like, we need the best tallest, you know, uh, sickest wide receiver available. The Kansas city chiefs will never make an attempt to go get Justin Jefferson. They don't need to. They need a guy that is that fits what Patrick Mahomes likes to do. And so they'll go and get, you know, uh, Xavier Leggett. I no, no, that's in uh, Carolina. Rashi Rice they got. They got Rashi Rice, but they got a new uh, speedster this uh, offseason. Oh, I forget his right. name. Um, Xavier Leggett is in Carolina. But, uh, um, yeah, no, I mean, this is this is what I, – I, I want Caleb Williams to do that eventually. Xavier Worthy. Xavier Worthy, so it's not Xavier Leggett. Yeah, Xavier Worthy running like a four-two-two. They said, "Hey, you know what? What are we? What are we missing? We're missing a guy to take the top off the defense, to isolate Travis Kelsey on the other side, to get a guy over the middle, to run drag routes because he's pulling the safeties back. That's what we need on this team." So they just gave him what he wanted. Is it necessarily the best receiver on the board? Possibly, probably not. You know, but they know that what he needs is that, and he can. If Xavier Worthy is doing something slightly wrong. Patrick Mahomes will chew his ass out. Patrick Mahomes is a nice guy. He's a funny family dude and he's in commercials and stuff, but don't get it messed up. Like 
Patrick Mahomes will chew your ass up because he knows he knows what he's doing and he knows what he wants. So I do want that out of Caleb Williams. I've seen it early out of Caleb Williams, but it is nice to know that like he's humble and he's still learning. And I think that's part of, um, you know, for Hank Aaron's comment, like he needs to dominate the short passing game right now. Yes, he does because he doesn't need to play hero ball right now. That'll Can come you with imagine time, but Caleb Williams chewing Keenan Allen out. <laughs> Listen, Keenan. I, I think it, I think they've alluded. I think he, somebody hinted towards the fact that that kind of happened in practice already, but it was more like a healthy chewing out of each other. For sure. But but I like that. I can't wait. Every time I hear Caleb Williams talk, I feel like he at least knows what he's talking about. There's no. I, I watched his press do conference. You remember? Today it was you remember, very fascinating. Do you remember the video with Peyton Manning sitting there on the sideline? Jeff Saturday's walking past. Oh, yeah. And we should have ran. We should have ran the ball. This and that. And he's just snapped. He's like, you know what, Jeff? Worry about snapping the ball. How about you just worry about snapping the ball? That's what you do. You just snap the ball. How about you do your job and just snap yeah. the fucking ball? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, dude, yeah. that's all we need you to do. We have offensive coordinators that call play. They're like, I, I'm at the line. I'll check to something if I want to fucking check to something. You do you and you snap the fucking ball. Like, dude, we. I would kill we need for that. Jeff you Saturday, need that. though. Need that. You need that, though. You need that. That's leadership and i mean things get fucking testy man i know um listening to mark schlereth on mike and golick over the years he said when he was on the redskins once they, man they would get into it with the defense he said they would first call the offense off the field offense would go into the locker room get stripped down go start taking showers and then the defense would get called it and he said this guy came in still talking shit and he goes man me and him got into a fight he's like i was butt naked he was in full pads <laughs> <laughs> and we're fighting in the locker room. <laughs> Why, like, dude, these guys are aggressive, man. They're aggressive, yeah. so you need to be aggressive to sit there and keep things in check. And you need to know what you're doing. You need to be confident. And like you said, I think Julian Edelman mentioned that Tom Brady might have taught him more than any wide receiver coach he's ever yeah. had. You uh, need that, was that from your quarterback. So these are all such important things, in my opinion. That th this is the stuff that I like to hear. And like, you know, beyond just what happens on the football field. Like, I don't think we were anywhere close to that with the previous quarterback. Like we were just trying to get it together on the field, but there was yeah. very little sense of control. I feel like we have it with Caleb. We're about to play a game here finally in three days. I mean, everything is lining up. I'm super, super excited for this season. I hope so. Keenan Allen's the, you know, because my, you know, what my biggest concern is, and I thought about this today and I can, we can end on this just because it was, and we can, flesh it out a little bit deeper in like a different episode or something. But I was thinking about it because they, somebody asked uh, Caleb Williams in his press conference today, like, what are the, what is the thing that you feel that you are the most like behind on so far in training camp and like it, progressing into the NFL and uh, might've not been that exact phrasing, but essentially he was saying like my blitz pickup, my, my line adjustment, my side adjustments, my, my sliding of protections and stuff like that, which is, Totally what it should be the answer, right? Like that's stuff that you get with experience where you see a safety come down and you're like, I've seen that before guys, you know, like ch change that up. Um, but you know, even with what we, I think our level of expectation is how much we're hyping up this season and Caleb Williams. And just like, we constantly forget that he's a, he's not a polished product. He's a really good prospect. That's why he was the first overall pick and would have been in the last 10, 15 drafts or whatever. He's a really good prospect, but let's not like, let's do, like he said, short passing game right now, dump offs, handoffs. Let's get Deandre Swift, six, seven, eight catches a game. Like, please. I like, I almost want to like post this on every social media account. Let's not do this to another quarterback again. Can we please give this kid like a year at least before we start shitting all over him like this th this is crazy like we gotta let him let him fail a little bit you know yeah and that that's the comment you're alluding to which is 100 percent true and it's like you know let's guys let's not pretend you know we're act a lot of everybody's acting like this is for sure like I, even I am like, it's a for sure thing, right? It, because it looks like it, like you're getting good reads out of camp and everything like that. And the talent is there and the situations there, everything's lining up to be perfect. But I mean, look, Baker Mayfield first overall, he's been on five teams, right? You look at the mm -hmm. draft that Trevor Lawrence won first overall. Sure. He got a contract. Zach Wilson 
went second right there. We th- we don't, we we're not even sure if he knows how to play football yet. Trey Lance is on the Cowboys. Can't throw accurate passes. In he might get cut. Mac Jones kicked a couple people in the nuts. Not starting anymore. Mm-hmm. Mr. Justin back in back in Buffalo. Dude, I mean, dude, let's not act like it's always a for sure thing. It's not, right? Like this still has to happen. It's still there's still quarterback progression ahead of us. The situation is there for it to happen, but yeah, you're right. Like like that's why it's we got to think about it a little bit more long term too. Like I know yeah. this that's why I asked that Keenan Allen question like is this here for Caleb to progress or for playoffs? Like playoffs would be great. But but I think we, no matter what, like we need this quarterback to progress so that we can make the playoffs year after year after year after year, right? I mean, I think that at the end of the day, that's what we all want. So that's guys, and it, it alludes to your point, man. Like Peyton Manning holds the record for interceptions, and it'll never be broken because no one has the patience to let these guys fail anymore. 100%. Like, we let we need to be ultimately patient with Caleb. Just let's be good fans. Yeah.